Hello, we're going to conclude 2 Thessalonians today. I hope it's been a good study for you. I hope it introduced the uh, concept of eschatology or the eschaton. I think it adds some tremendous insight to Matthew 24 and Mark 13 about the Antichrist, who we see in uh, 1 John 2, 18 also. Put those together, it kind of gives you something of the difficulty as well as the tremendous splendor of what's going to happen to us as believers. Now in chapter 3, Paul, being a good preacher, says finally, which just means he's winding down, he's not through yet. Um, we're, we're going to a practical section. He's going to try to pull this theology together and uh, make it applicable. Most of Paul's letters divide right in half, a doctrinal section and a practical section. And we're coming to that, this church that he loved so much. I think he loved this church as much as he loved Philippi, Philippi. And it's just a tremendous letter. Now, brothers, pray for us. Now, Paul's asked that several times. He asked it back in chapter uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 25. He asked for it in Ephesians 6, 19 at the conclusion of that spiritual battle and the, and the weapons that we have and the, the armor. I guess one of the greatest mysteries for me is intercessory prayer. Here's Paul, felt like he needed prayer for himself. And as we're going to read, he didn't want prayer for personal things. Uh, he wanted prayer connected with the ministry of the Lord. I hope we pray like that and want prayer on our behalf because of the ministry, not because of something we just want. The thing that's always amazed me about intercessory prayer is how it works. For it's the mystery of a sovereign God working in the life of an individual to whom he's given free will, but with more intensity because of the um, prayers of other people. Now, God loves uh, men and women as much as uh, and far more than any other uh, individual can. And yet God has chosen to limit himself to the prayers of his children. Intercessory prayer not only changes us who pray, but intercessory prayer changes things in others, not only believers, but unbelievers. It changes situations. It changes hearts. It's, a, it's an impetus toward uh, affirming the will of God in other circumstances and lives. Now, how God uses that, I don't know. But, boy, I'm so glad that he does. Now, notice where it says that the message of the Lord, and again, the Lord here is used to the deity. It can be, it's a Greek word for sir or mister, uh, but in theological passages it refers to full deity. Curios. May continue to spread. This is the word like a runner. It's present tense. May continue to run. You might want to see Psalm 147.15 where the same idea is used, the spreading of the good news and prove its glorious power. There are two present tense verbs here. Uh, Williams doesn't translate that way, but there are two verbs, and both are present tense, continue. Uh, as it did among you, and he's continued to say, apparently the critic said, Paul wasn't effective. He, he was here three weeks, he left, he's not coming back, he doesn't care about you. Paul said, oh, that's not true, that's not true. Oh, I do care. First Thessalonians, he defends himself. And they were saying, well, he wasn't effective, he didn't really do anything. Paul says, you're the evidence that we did something. Okay? Now, verse 2. That we may be delivered, this is aorist tense, and because the article is here, it's aorist tense verb, delivered once and for all, with this, a definite article, I think it's a specific thing he's referring to. Now, we know they had a lot of problems in Corinth with the Judaizers and other things, and so something is in his mind he's praying for God's help with. Delivered from the unprincipled and wicked men. It's something at Corinth, we're not sure what. Uh, for not all men have the faith. Now, the faith is used in the sense, apparently here, of the doctrine of Christianity, the, the teachings, the understanding about Christ, and that seems to be the inference here. Verse 3. But the Lord is to be trusted. Now, remember I told you last time, the word faith found the end of chapter 2, and the word trusted found in the first of chapter 3 are the same root. It's the word pistis or pistuo in Greek, it's the Old Testament term, amen. In English, we have to translate it by three words, faith, hope, and believe, to catch the idea. Its primary focus in the Old Testament is the trustworthiness of God. Its original etymology was to be firm or to be sure, speaking of footing. And it came to mean trustworthiness or loyalty, too. Uh, here, the idea of trusted, this means we can trust God. The only hope of Christianity is there's a trustworthy God who's made trustworthy statements in sending his trustworthy son, and we can depend on God's word and work. There's no foundation. Now, notice where it says, and he will give you strength and guard you from the evil one. Notice it's his power, not ours. Now, the word guard is used in 1 John 5, 18. 
and I think it's a very important word. It's the first of a series of military terms. We have the word guard. We have the word directions in verse 4. It's repeated in verse 6 in several places. We have the word shirker. That means someone who falls out of the ranks, is disorderly conduct. So the chapter has a lot of military terms, okay, which I think emphasizes Paul's position as apostle to order this church what to do. Now, notice it says, from, now mine has the evil one with a definite article, which assumes the title for the devil. There is some um, words in Greek that can mean be neuter or masculine. This is one of them. I really think that it should be masculine. Uh, the early church kind of split on this. Uh, the eastern church and Tertullian in the west said that it should be primarily masculine, while the Western church for the longest time took it neuter, keep us from evil. Now, it's the same problems in the Lord's Prayer. Are we to be delivered from the evil one or from evil? Well, I think it's the evil one. Let me give you a few references where the masculine is used. Uh, Matthew 5, 37. Matthew 6, 13. Matthew 13, 19 and 38. John 17, 15. 1 John 2, 13 and 14. 1 John, I can't read my own writing, 3, uh, 12, and 1 John 5, 18 and 19 is, are some of those references. Notice where it says, by the way, I, I believe in a personal force of evil. Um, I think we get a little ridiculous on that when we get enamored with evil and black magic and de the demonic. Let me say to you that there is a personal force of evil with fallen angels, apparently the demons, out to thwart everything that God wants to do, both individually and collectively. But uh, this is not a Zoroastrian dualism. Satan is a created being. He serves the purpose of God. See the prologue to the book of Job. And Satan does nothing unless God allows it. Satan is in the will of God for some reason, a mystery to us. He is a created being. He is a defeated foe. He is a dog on a chain, and he summons to the bid of God. There is not a, an ultimate fight between right and wrong. Friends, I've read the last chapter of the book, and it is a marvelous ending. Now, verse 4, we have confidence. And this is in perfect tense. We, can, we have confidence in the past. It abides in a state of being. Uh, and notice it, it's in you through the Lord. And there's the hope. It's in the Lord's work. But it comes into us as hope and confidence. That you are now practicing the directions. There's that military term for a command. It's found in 4, 6, 10, and 12. Which we give you and that you will continue to do so. Okay? Uh, let's see. May the Lord guide. Now this word for guide is a word that we get in the Old Testament it's primarily to make straight by the means of removing obstacles from the road. We see it in Luke chapter 1, verse 79. We see it in 1 Thessalonians 3, 11. Um, it's a word that speaks of um, <laughs> well-worn paths. God has given us some guidelines, and God has removed the barriers for us in those guidelines. It's the idea of the, the path, uh, uh, the old uh, vacation Bible school verse, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It's the idea of the ancient way, the early title for the church, and that's the idea here. May guide you into a realization. Here are the two things he's praying for. May the Lord, it's a prayer. Here are the two things. A realization of God's love for you. Now, friends, I've heard someone say that great preaching is telling Christians what they already are in Jesus. I hope that your uh, Christianity is primarily positively oriented in the love of God for you through the work of Christ and not rule-oriented or servant-oriented or uh, ritual-oriented. If when we know the love of God, his attitude of Father toward us, oh man, it makes everything else uh, so much easier to do. Now the second prayer is, and into a patient endurance like Christ, we're to have a lifestyle, a patience, a voluntary, active, steadfast endurance along the examples of Christ's life. And once we know the love of God, then we can perform the other. It's both a mental attitude and a lifestyle expression, and both are so important. Now, notice in verse 6, now we charge you, there's that strong term for a military command, you brothers on the authority of the Lord Jesus. Now here is that 
He is uh, charging them as an apostle, strict orders, and he's doing it. And a mind has on the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, but the literal here is in the name of. Now in the Old Testament, the name of someone was very important. They named them and hoped that the name would be characterized in the life. So in Hebrew, the name is a characteristic of the person. It's a more descriptive title than it is in, in English, say. So here, it's the character of the Lord. It's the authority of the Lord and Paul, his apostle. Very strong. To hold your say. It's a present middle infinitive, but in Greek, it's used as an imperative, so it's a command. Now, the word hold yourself, aloof, is the idea not of being totally ostracized like excommunication, which the New Testament does teach in certain instances, but this is in-house discipline, in-church discipline, where we don't have uh, repeated, intimate contact with these people who are in the church but out of the will of God, away from the apostles' teachings. And, and that's the idea here. Now, the word used to describe this person is a shirker. It's used in verse 6, it's used in verse 7, it's used in verse 11. Now, a shirker is the idea of someone who um, is out of ranks, uh, subordin insubordinate, uh, disobedient to a command. It's a military term. Now, the background is in 1 Thessalonians 4, 11 and 12, and 1 Thessalonians 5, 14. As you remember, the problem was that some folks that got so caught up in the second coming that they had kind of uh, quit working and were just waiting for it. In our own culture, we have many examples of that. Remember the people who moved to the mountains and re refused to let their kids go to school because the Lord's coming is soon? This was the same kind of uh, exuberance uh, in error here. Uh, they're not to be kicked out of the church, but they are to be disciplined by the church and back into a, a, a more uh, apostolic line of teaching which says be ready, be active when the Lord's come, not just sit and wait. So these folks weren't working. Uh, they were just going around house to house, spreading their unique doctrine, busybodies. And Paul says, friends, that's not good. They don't work, they don't eat. As simple as that. And that's the idea here. Now, instead of following the teachings you receive from us. Now, remember they had no Bible at this time. All they had was the apostolic teachings, and they were authoritative. And here we have the idea of the word teachings is the same word as the traditions. And so that's what Paul's speaking about, the things he taught them. You know yourselves how you ought, dia, moral necessity, they understood they should do it, to follow my example. And that's a very important thing, I follow his example. For I was not a shirker when I was with you. I did not eat any man's bread without paying for it. Uh, but with toil and hard labor, I worked night and day in order not to be a burden to any of you. Now we know that the idea of work, and I want to deal basically with the theology of that. It's often called a Protestant work ethic, but I think... That's not valid. There's a New Testament pattern on work. And let me go back through it. Let's start with the, the Garden of Eden. Work is not connected with the curse. In Genesis chapter 2.15, man was to keep the garden before sin ever entered it. But after the curse, uh, labor is part of the toil that man will have to do to produce enough to eat. And that's in Genesis 3.19. Now, we must somehow balance Paul's words here about I worked with my own hands and took nothing from any of you. All rabbis worked for a living. Um, Paul uh, was a tent maker. Along with Priscilla and Aquila, he made tents, and he was often accused of uh, preaching for the wrong motives, so he wouldn't let any church help him. The only two exceptions, probably, are the Philippian church and possibly this church at Thessalonica, though we're, we're not sure. But we must balance his idea, but I'm not going to take any help, I'm going to do it all myself, with his continued emphasis on uh, his offering for the poor in Jerusalem. You might want to see Romans 15, 26 through 29, uh, 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, and Galatians 2, 10. Uh, in, in Acts 24, 17, Paul encourages giving alms to the poor, so you must balance that. He is not taking help, but he is willingness to help those who are poor. These folks weren't poor. They were, uh, um, it's not they were out of work, temporary out of work. They were idle, uh, insubordinate people in the church. Now, from Deuteronomy 5.13, we find that work is the norm for all men. We learn also that work is a gift from God. Work is a gift from God. Exodus 35.35 35, 
Exodus 31, 3, Isaiah 54, 16. And I think the book of Ecclesiastes has a very a positive place for, for daily work. We get joy from that. It's something God gives us to do. Um, let's see. Right, one more thing I want to say about work. Whether you sweep a street or preach a revival in the largest stadiums in the world, what we do, we do as unto the Lord. Ephesians 6, 7, Colossians 3, 17. All work for a Christian is as unto the Lord. That's a very important doctrine. It shows the quality of the Christian's work. We are to work. We are to work as unto the Lord. The quality of our labor should point men to Christ as the uh, sincerity of our witness and our uh, lifestyle should point men to Christ. Now, let me go back there. Paul says, I work night and day. Remember the Jewish order is that evening always comes before morning, going back to Genesis 1.1. Now, let's see. Verse 9. Not that I had no right to be uh, supported. Now, Paul, although he personally wouldn't take any money, he never uh, condemns the fact that uh, the preachers are worthy of their pay. I guess the classical passage for that would be 1 Corinthians chapter 9, almost the whole chapter, and you might want to read that. Okay, uh, notice if you would where it, um, let's see, uh, verse 10. Uh, for when I was with you, I gave you this direction. There's that strong military word for command. If a person refuses to work, he must not be allowed to eat. This is a present imperative. Now, this is not, like I said, the poor or the temporary out of work or the person who wants to work and can't find work. This is a particular situation, not a universal principle. It's these people in the church who've got so overcome with the excitement of the second coming, they've quit their job and they're just going around from house to house trying to say, let's just get ready. Uh, let's just go up on the mountain and wait. Let's just pray. No. The New Testament teaches we are to be active and we are to be ready and Jesus will come as a surprise. Now, notice where, again, it mentions in uh, verse 11. But we are informed. This is present tense. It means we keep hearing. Now, we don't know how Paul heard um, because first Timothy has come back and First Thessalonians was written to answer Timothy's uh, uh, information. But he heard again that the problems about the second coming were continuing in this church, and so he had to write this second letter. It's primarily about the social problems in the church, and about the Antichrist. Now, the first, first Thessalonians answered, what about those who have died? How will they participate in the end time events? This book is to answer questions about the Antichrist, when he's going to come, all of that, and what about those who've gone berserk over it in the church? How do we handle those? Okay, difference. That among you there are living as shirkers, mere busybodies instead of busy at work. Now, here's a Greek play on the word busy. They're busybodies, not busy at work. Um, Notice, notice this one, verse 12. Now, in the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, there is his apostolic authority in Jesus' name. We charge you, there's that military term, and exhort such persons to do their own work with quietness and eat their own bread. Now, it may surprise you, but the goal of the Christian life is a quiet life. Sometimes American culture gets us so pumped up, you know, go out there and strike while the iron's hot and be aggressive and take the bull by the horns. That's not the biblical framework. We are to live quiet, gentle lives, examples of God's love in all that we do. Now, I'll give you a few other verses of that. You might want to see 1 Thessalonians 4, 11, and you might want to see 1 Timothy 2, 2. It's a biblical mandate, quiet, gentle lives. Now, verse 13. But you, brothers, must never grow tired in doing right. You mean there's a weariness? Oh, yeah. I think one of the greatest words we can say to each other is, hang in there, friend. Keep on keeping on. It's going to be worth it all when we get to see Jesus. Do not grow weary in well-doing. We all tend to do that. Let me give you a few scriptures where this encouragement is made. Luke 18, 1. Galatians 6, 9. 2 Corinthians 4, 1. Hang in there. Keep on trucking. It's going to be worth it all. You say, but, oh, there's so many obstacles. There are obstacles. There's so many that are doing it the other way. There are people who we have problems with in the church, but... With the life that we have, we must live a life of love in quietness, and God will do the rest. God will use and promote and make effective our witness for him. Notice what it says then in verse 14, if, this is a first-class conditional sentence assumed to be true. I think we see something of the power of this first-class conditional uh, in uh, Matthew 4 where Satan says, if you are the Son of God, make these stones bread. 
When I read that, it seems like that Satan is denying that Jesus is the Messiah. But because it's first class, Satan knows Jesus is the Messiah, but he's trying to get him to use his powers in a certain way to win men. This same first class idea is used in Romans 8.31 where it says, If God be for us, who can be against us? And some days I'm not sure God's for me because I'm such a rebellious, sinful person. But that's first class conditional. Since God is for us, who can be against us? So the first class here is assuming there are some in the church who are refusing to obey what we have said in this letter. Mark that person. This is the word tag. That is a present middle imperative. You yourself, once and for all, as a command for me, as a representative from God, mark that man out. And stop having anything to do with him so that he will feel ashamed of it. Now notice verse 15. You must not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. This is a church discipline, not to the point of excommunication. Now, that's for people who are immoral or bringing reproach in the church. But this is in-house discipline for the purpose of correcting theological error. Now, if they will not listen to the apostle, they are to be censured in the sense of not having intimate, close, personal, repetitive fellowship with them. But remember, all, always the purpose of discipline is redemptive. I don't know about you, the churches where I've been, where discipline came up, it was always ugly, it was always vindictive, it was always critical, it was always a terrible scene. The, early, the, the modern church has lost this biblical mandate of discipline, and that's regretful. But if it's ever recovered, it'll be recovered in the spirit of love with the purpose of redemption, not the purpose of judgment. Now, notice in verse 16 where it says, and may the Lord who gives us peace, and here again is the prayer, it's the peace-loving God. Paul speaks of the peace-loving God so often. The God of peace, the peace-loving God. Mm, I tell you what, it amazed me. He closes so many of his letters like that. Um, give you peace in whatever circumstance you may be in. This is so hard for us. In modern America, we tend to be uh, circumstantial-oriented. If we're healthy and wealthy and our insurance policy is paid up and our home is uh, on time with the payments and we, we have what we want and need, and then we're thankful and, 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 and content and quiet. But friends, I want to tell you, if, if your peace in God is connected to circumstance, it's always a moment from being taken away from you. There ought to be that quiet peace that passes understanding deep in every believer's heart that no winds of circumstance can touch. It's that peace connected to the fact that God loves us and is for us and that nothing just happens to his children and that whatever we're going through, if we do in love and patience, God's going to use it for glory, for himself. That's the peace that we're talking about. Notice where it says, the Lord be with you all. And notice the word all in verse 18. Oh, Paul, what a tactful, loving man. Notice, notice he's saying those of you who are kind of out of fellowship, those of you who are a little wrong and, and won't listen to my teachings, I want the God of peace to be with you too. I want the God of peace to be with all of you, those who, are, who, who uh, love me and follow me and listen to me and those who don't. Oh, what a man. Be with you all. And you know what? There is no greater blessing in the Christian life than the presence of the Lord. We need the giver more than the gift. We need him more than anything in our lives. The presence of the Lord is the key. It's the key in all things. Um, let's see. Notice verse 17. This greeting is in my own hand, Paul's. It is a mark in every letter of mine. Now, this was a symbol for the, thought, for the fact it was genuine. We know there were some false apostles writing some spurious letters. And so Paul says he let a scribe write most of his books. But at the very end, he took the pen with his own hand and wrote. One of them, it says, look at what large letters I'm writing you, which tells me that uh, Paul's star in the flesh was, was eye problem. I think it was oriental ophthalma. But there's several places this, this appears. You might want to see 2 Thessalonians 2.2. 2. You might want to see 1 Corinthians 16.21, Colossians 4.18, and Philemon 19, where Paul seems to take the pen right with his own hand to show the genuineness of these letters. Okay? And then verse 18. The spiritual blessings of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And there he closes much as he began in the spirit of the grace of God. He had just talked about the peace earlier, and now he's in grace. These two always go together. The grace of God in Jesus Christ, the peace that comes in the heart of a sinful man as he understands the love of God, understands the provision in Christ through the mediation of the Holy Spirit. 
That, that's the peace. The peace is not health, wealth, prosperity, and good cheer. Grace is not connected with our sinlessness, though we are moving to sinning less and we are moving to, to fuller and fuller maturity. We're accepted in the beloved by the grace of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. This has been a great book. I hope you'll go back through here and think through what Paul is saying. We are so guilty sometimes of taking these little chapters or verses out of context. It is far better when studying a book of the Bible to read through the whole book and outline the flow of the message so you will not take it out of context just to prove our little uh, pet peeves on the second coming or our view of eschatology or our millennial position. Look at the flow of these two books and I think maybe how it's often proof text is not faithful to the flow of the message. Well, I've really enjoyed being with you. I hope you'll uh, read these two books together, outline them. Um, thank you for praying for me. Have a good day. God bless.